I'd like to welcome you to Women in Politics. My name is Rebecca Johnson Melvin from the University of Delaware, which is fortunate to be a member institution of the Delaware uh, Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries. And we're also fortunate to be contributors to In Her Own Right. I have a few short housekeeping notes and a very brief introduction for our session. So the chat feature, as you're seeing, is disabled for the audience, but our technical host and panelist will be able to share information with you through chat. Please use the Q&A feature to pose your questions throughout the session. We will have time for discussion at the end of the presentations, so we encourage you to post your questions as they occur to you. Please use that Q&A. And also, the option to turn on the closed caption settings is available on the bottom screen, so you can toggle that on. Dr. Oakley will be speaking on June. I'm so sorry, Rebecca, you got muted by accident. Okay, this is a reminder that the session is being recorded and it will be available through In Her Own Right site in the future. So it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers today, Wendy Chimilevsky and Jill Norg, followed by Allison Parker. They are associated with Swarthmore College, the City University of New York, and the University of Delaware, respectively. But I encourage you to all visit the fuller biographical notes about our panelists. These links will be shared in the chat and other information will be shared in the chat as we listen to them. On the rare occasion of my going out anywhere in the whole past year, I drove up to Wilmington on I-95 and I saw for the first time a huge billboard presenting a giant pair of spiked high heels standing on a pile of cracked glass. Kamala Harris broke the ceiling is what it said. I don't know who's responsible for the billboard and I couldn't take a photo because I was the only one in the car and I was driving but I thought it was such an apt image for our session about women in politics today. Wendy and Jill met through shared research interest in Belva Lockwood, an accomplished and an ambitious woman who tried to crack the glass through two presidential campaigns way back in the 1880s. They will talk about their research bringing to light thousands of women who entered the political arena in America even before they gained suffrage rights in 1920. And Allison will bring us into the 20th century and talk about Black women's partisan activism through the lens of Mary Church Terrell, the subject of her recent biography, Unceasing. So please join me in welcoming Wendy to start our program. Rebecca? Yes. Uh, I think I was going to go first, but you mentioned Wendy's name. All right. Sorry. I thought Wendy was going first. So Jill, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about our work and our project. In 2008, I published the biography of Belva Lockwood, one of the first women lawyers in the United States. And in 1884, the first woman to run a full campaign for the US presidency. Lockwood was ambitious and would have loved to win the office, but in fact, hers was a symbolic campaign meant to show that women were interested in politics. During the campaign, she repeatedly said, I cannot vote, but I can be voted for. The fact of Lockwood's campaign prompted several of my colleagues to ask, in the 19th and early 20th century, did other women seek elective office in order to promote the discussion of women's rights while not expecting to win? Or equally radical, in these years, did women in the United States campaign for elective office fully invested in the prospect of winning? The answer to each question is a resounding yes. We now know that between 1853, when Maine resident Olive Rose 
won a county political officer, that of Register of Deeds, and ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, more than 4,300 women ran for political office in the United States, primarily at the town, county, and state levels. Let me say parenthetically that this number rises weekly and that we expect it to go to at least 6,000. The existence of these already noted 4,000 plus women was uncovered through research conducted by members of the Her Hat Was in the Rind project. Historian biographers, Wendy Chemileski, Kristen Grinbecker, and I founded the project and its website, about which Wendy will speak shortly. That was a decade ago. We guessed our sleuthing would bring to light 100 or 200 such women. Believe me when I say we did not expect thousands. So briefly, who were these women? Where did they live? And what offices did they run for? And how was it that they could run for office when many, most really, could not vote? These female candidates were primarily Caucasian and Christian. With a few exceptions, we do not find Jewish women or women of color appearing as candidates until a few years before 1920. Some of these thousands of women candidates came from modest circumstances. Others were solidly middle class. Expanding educational opportunities gave them the literacy and status generally needed to run for office. Women candidates ran for office in their 20s and as seniors, but most were middle-aged. They campaigned in states and territories all over our country, although very little in the South and the Southwest. How could they run? At the time, under the principle of federalism, the US Constitution gave the power to define political rights, such as voting and holding office, to the states. After early women's rights conventions in the 1840s, activists began to submit petitions to their state legislatures demanding the right to vote and the right to hold office. Early female candidates like Olive Rose faced an entirely male electorate, as did a portion of our women candidates right up until 1920. As states started opening up some elective offices, women began running for office in significant, if still small numbers, beginning in 1870. Judging from the biographical information we have recovered, 19th century candidates grew out of many different motivations, but a handful stand out. The desire to improve their towns, roads, sanitation, and schools, a desire to win equality for women and show women's capabilities, a desire to put temperance policies in place, a desire to implement farm and labor reform policies, and a desire to, to climb the professional ladder in the field of education and to obtain a salary. Somewhat more than half of the women candidates we have uncovered sought alleged, excuse me, education-related offices, school board positions, county superintendents' offices, and by the end of the 19th century, the powerful position of state superintendent of schools. School offices were the first to open to women. Critically, however, nearly half of our women candidates ran for non-education related offices. They won election as mayor and town council members. By the late 1880s, they had set the bar higher and announced as candidates for statewide offices, lieutenant governor, state attorney, and state legislators. From the 1890s to 1920, as suffrage for women expanded, more than 300 women ran for state legislative positions. Many won. They ran on major party tickets and on third party tickets of the period such as socialist, farm labor, and prohibition, a really important one. They succeeded most, office at, most often as a candidate of a major party. 
1916, Montana Republican Jeanette Rankin broke another barrier and became the first woman elected to a federal office membership in the United States House of Representatives. Make no mistake, however, although thousands ran for office, there were challenges. Opponents of women's rights and defeated male candidates sued and petitioned to stop women candidates. Some of these challenges succeeded, generally through the decision of a court, but obviously thousands did not. Throughout the last quarter of the 19th century and into the 20th, court decisions and new state legislation secured the right of women to run for office. All of this meant, the women, meant that the winners gained status as elected officials. They gained respect in their communities, influenced public policies, and in some instances earned a living, that is a salary, as well as serving as a role model for other women interested in elective public service. Let me personalize the numbers with the names of several of the women candidates who ran for office, most of them without having the right to vote. And you'll find biographies of all of these women on the website that Wendy's going to describe. And with respect to the first woman that I'm going to speak about, Belva Lockwood, you'll find her papers in the Swarthmore College Peace Collection. So, in 1884, Washington, D.C. attorney Belva Lockwood ran for the U.S. presidency. She was 54 and twice a widow. She campaigned across the United States using lecture fees to pay for her travel expenses. She published a 12-point policy platform and was written up by the leading newspapers and magazines of the day. Kate Kennedy emigrated from Ireland with her family first to New York City and in 1856 to San Francisco, where she taught school and later won a principal's position. She became a well-known labor activist interested in particular in the question of equal pay for women as, as was Belva Lockwood. In 1886, she campaigned for the position of California State Superintendent uh, on the United Labor Party ticket. She did not win. In Cottonwall Falls, Kansas in 1889, Mary Groundwater ran for and won the office of police judge. In Nebraska in 1895, Anna Woodby campaigned on the Prohibition Party ticket for the office of State University Regent, but did not win. In the US Census, she was listed as a minister. Both of Woodby's parents were born in pre-Civil War slave states, and she was one of the first African-American women in the United States nominated for elective office, along with African-American Amelia Allen, who in 1890 ran successfully for the Salina, Kansas School Board. In 1919 and again in 1920, African-American Grace Campbell ran for a seat in the New York State Leg uh, Legislature, the Assembly, on the Socialist Party ticket. She won neither time. Jewish women started organizing political campaigns a decade after African-American women. Hannah Solomon, a Democrat and advocate for the rights of children, polled well but lost attempts in 1904 and 1916 to become a University of Illinois trustee. Also in 1904, Pauline Sinem, also Jewish, running as a nonpartisan, won a seat on the Toledo, Ohio School Board. And yes, she was Gloria Steinem's grandmother. Catherine Waugh, a lawyer, temperance and suffrage activist, ran for Illinois State Attorney in 1888 on the temperance party ticket. She was defeated, but was influential as a role model. In 1907, now Catherine McCulloch, the married mother of four, she ran for justice of the peace in a highly contested and publicized race against a man, won and was re later reelected. In later years, Florence Allen, the first woman judge on the US Court of Appeals, cited McCulloch's example as a motivation. And finally, 
Adelina Otero Warren, a member of New Mexico's landed Hispanic elite and a successful businessman, businesswoman, won election in 1918 as superintendent of schools for Santa Fe, New Mexico. She was reelected until 1929. In 1922, she won the Republican primary as candidate for US House of Representatives. She was a gifted campaigner who emphasized her heritage. Otero Warren was the first New Mexico woman and the first Latina to run for national office. She lost the election after a relative revealed that she was a divorcee, a no-no, not a widow. Women ran for elective office even when they could not vote. It showed faith in the ideal of democracy as well as the belief that citizenship was larger than the right of, su of suffrage. Members of the Her Hat Project are proud to have found women who ran for office before 1920 and to have detailed their activism as candidates an act Congressman John Lewis would have called making good trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Jill and Wendy. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming to the session and for having us here. Um, I'm going to give two short uh, different talks. Uh, one, first one about the Her Hat Was in the Ring website and digital project, and then a case history um, on Pennsylvania in the 1870s. So I'm going to share my screen. <sighs> Sorry, I just uh, I thought I had this all set up, but of course that isn't. Uh, here we go. All right, so um, as Jill mentioned, um, the, the Her Hat Was in the Ring project um, has been going on for quite a while. And let me just get my uh, notes as well. Oops, sorry, just skipped ahead there. Seems to be a little slow here. All right. All right. Um, so it's an on, this is an ongoing project tracing as many women as possible who were nominated, campaigned, or were elected to political office in the United States before the ratification of the 19th Amendment in August of 1920. Um, there's a free and public website backed by a continually updated uh, database. Um, the project cre uh, creators are Jill, myself, and Kristen Gwynn Becker, uh, with assistance now and then from interns and others. And I just want to give a quick shout out to one of them, Chloe Lucchesi Malone, who has also worked on other in her own right projects. So who is included in the project? Any US woman who was nominated or campaigned or was elected to political office before August of 1920. Who was not included in the project. Um, women who were hired to fill government offices such as postmistresses, deputy town clerks or legislative clerks, nor are women who were appointed to an office by a governor, mayor or school board. Why these parameters? Um, we believe nomination by a political party and or facing the voters was a significant marker of women's citizenship rights. Plus there were tens of thousands of women uh, hired or appointed to offices and this was just too large a project for our small team. So what can you learn about these women in political life through this project? You can search by a woman's name and find her biographical entry. In the entries, there are some of her demographics. And you can see Hannah Solomon, whom uh, Jill mentioned. There's information about the campaigns that she ran. 
And in the biographical information, we have concentrated on the political campaigns and partici participation in political life. We've also included images of her if we can find them. Um, we also list the resources where we found, where we located the information used in the entry. There are other searching options. You can search women by state. Here's a list of women from Iowa in all the search results. You'll see the number of women who ran for office and the number of campaigns they ran. Um, so far, we've located 263 women in Iowa who ran in 462 campaigns. You can search women by political party um, or by office for which they campaigned. And women ran in over 80 different offices. Or you can combine all these options and search for for example, Republican county treasurers in Utah. With each of these results, you can filter for additional data that we've collected. So you can learn how many Republican women county register of deeds won or lost their races, or sort them by state or region and other information. This, this site, unlike other digital history sites, allows us to aggregate the data we have collected. This project was only possible because of the digitization of thousands of contemporary books, government reports, local histories, digitized and searchable newspapers, census data via, via ancestry.com, websites collecting and providing information and genealogy websites. And of course, because of historians, librarians, and archivists who have digitized hundreds of thousands of images and documents and have written about these pioneering women on their websites. This complex project is designed in collaboration with History IT, a digital preservation company, and Kristen Gwynne Becker, historian, founder, and company CEO, and the third member of the HERHAP team. A new and updated version of the HERHAT website is due out, due out next month. We will have a new look to the site, information on 400 more women, which Jill and I have added, and more advanced searching functions. We will add more images, create exhibits, and the new version will allow us to add other information and pages. We also have an ongoing Facebook page right now featuring women candidates, uh, new items from our private collection of campaign materials, and Jill and I are working on a book on the history of US women's electoral rights. We hope you will use the site and tell others about it, uh, and tell us about it. Also do let us know about any women you have found whose names are not yet on the site. Okay. Get to my second. Let me close this one. All right, so um, let me just get to my notes. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the case of Pennsylvania and women's electoral rights um, in Pennsylvania. Um, this is a case study, some of which information was learned uh, through the site. And some of the women you'll see noted are actually already in the HERHAT database. Um, from 1872 to 1873, Pennsylvania held a constitutional, a state constitutional convention, and women's uh, suffrage organizations organized con uh, and campaigned convention delegates to change state law and allow women the right to vote. Despite 23 petitions from suffrage organizations across the state, all suffrage rights for women were voted down uh, by convention delegates. Suffrage opponents argued that women's place was in the home, the women were represented at the polls by their male relatives, the woman's suffrage would produce family discord, and that participation in politics would be degrading to women. 
Um, and opponents also maintained that women did not want the right to vote and would not take advantage of it if it were granted. Mary Grew, president of the Pennsylvania Women's Suffrage Association, reported that some of the convention delegates opposed voting for women because politics were, quote, a sink of corruption, that its atmosphere is defiling, that womanly refinement would be forever lost if permitted to come within its influence, end quote. However, such beliefs did not stop convention delegates from voting in favor of making women eligible to be elected to school offices in the state. Thus, enter politics, that sink of corruption. Many supporters of women's school office holding were not in favor of suffrage. Convention delegate Charles R. Buckaloo believed women would be satisfied with the option of elective office and abandon the suffrage cause. Delegate Ma Malcolm Hay argued that he would vote against women's electoral rights because he thought, quote, it a most singular absurdity to propose that we should give per to persons the right to hold office to whom we have already denied the right of voting. But by 1873, women had electoral rights, uh, but not fr the franchise in five other states, Michigan, Iowa, New Hampshire, Maine, and Kansas. He also argued that he could, quote, see no sufficient or sound reason why women should be permitted to hold one public office and be restricted from any other, end quote. This argument was echoed by other opponents across the country, including judges in several court cases on women's rights during the 1870s. However, the Pennsylvania School Office Amendment was carried by a vote of 60 to 32 delegates pushed through by suffrage supporters, including John M. Brumall, a state politician, and John H. Campbell, editor of the Legal Gazette, a newspaper, and other delegates of the convention. The state superintendent of public instruction, James P. Wickersham, also supported women's rights and testified the beginning before the convention in support of the new electoral regulation. And his sister became one of the first women to be elected to her local school board in February of 1874. In Philadelphia's 13th Ward, the executive committee of the local Republican Party nominated two female candidates and called upon Harriet W. Paste and Letitia Wolper to run for two seats on the Ward School Committee. Both women were white, native born, and lived in family, families of significant economic and cultural resources. Paste was a member of the Education Committee of the Quaker Green Street Meeting, and the rest of this presentation will, will concentrate on the campaign of these candidates, especially Paste. 13th Ward Republican officials soon regretted their decision to nominate women for the Ward School Committee. 20 years later, activist Emily Hallowell wrote about the affair, quote, I have not discovered what prompted or inspired them to commit this radical and unprecedented act of nominating women, perhaps, however, a temporary hallucination, as facts later may induce us to believe. Mrs. Paste accepted the offer in all good faith. It did not take long, however, for the hallucination to pass, for as if awakening from a dream, the committee, realizing what they had done, began at once to try and untie the knot which they had made, end quote. Soon after the primary election, some Republican leaders believed that the election of Henry C. Dunlap, their candidate for Philadelphia City Council, would be in jeopardy if women were on the ticket for the general election. Republican committee members then issued a letter supposedly written by Harriet Paste withdrawing her candidacy, but it turned out to be a forgery. At a Republican party meeting, Letitia Wolper's son declared that he represented his mother and that she was still a candidate. At this meeting, Rep leading Republican William B. Elliott declared, quote, it is it is inexpedient to have any ladies on the ticket at this time, end quote. Despite protesters, protests of supporters of Pace and Walper, ward officials threw the women off the ticket for the general election. These, include, these officials included Marlon Kopach, a candidate for the school committee who had lost to the women. 
Harriet Page soon issued a campaign card declaring her continuing candidacy, and it was distributed to voters throughout the 13th Ward. Pace wrote, quote, I must in justice to myself expose the fraud and deception that have been practiced to defeat my election, end quote, and went on to accuse the Repo honorable men of the Ward Republican Party of lying, forgery, bribery, and stealing city funds. Pace continued that if she had the power of Patrick Henry or Brutus, she, quote, might put these designing, intriguing politicians in their true light. They deserve to be held up to the scorn of the community, end quote. In desperation, the Republican officials accused Paste of, quote, being a Quaker, of beating her husband, and of spelling chairman without the letter I, end quote. With her husband and other supporters, Paste held a public meeting that was, quote, packed from pit to dome, and that when she entered, the band played Hail to the Chief, end quote. Pace gave a concise address in which she spoke of betrayal, justice, the American democratic process, recent changes in Pennsylvania law, and quoted from Euripides, as well as Caesar's, Julius Caesar and Othello, thus, thus dispelling any notion that she lacked an education. Pace revealed that Philadelphia Alderman Charles M. Carpenter had even said she was not a member of the Republican Party because she was not a voter. Pace declared, quote, desperate are these politicians in their death throes, for doomed they are to political death and destruction. Having emancipated ourselves so recently from the thraldom of African slavery, shall we now bow our heads and tamely submit to this political yoke being welded around our necks? Or shall we arise in our might and shake it off? I leave it with the voters of the 13th Ward to say this outrage shall go unrebuked at the polls. As women in Pennsylvania could not vote, Pace appealed to the male voters who elected the women by a large majority. Walper died soon after the election, so did not serve on the school committee. Other school committee members made it clear the pace to pace that she was not wanted, but she persevered and ran for unsu unsuccessfully for a second term. Her support for education lasted beyond her political service, and at her death in 1899, she left about $25,000 to area Quaker schools in support of young women. It is not yet clear how many other women across Pennsylvania won their seats on their local school boards before 1920, but in 1874, at least 32 women across the state ran for the offices. And you can see here a, a map of the state with stars uh, designated where women ran uh, and campaigned as well. And they ran in rural counties as well as more uh, urban ones. By the 1890s, at least 16 more women had won seats to the Philadelphia School Committees. And you see a few of them here. And in the first years of the 20th century, there were additional candidates to the school committees. As to suffrage rights, women in Pennsylvania only gained any right to vote in 1920 with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Some of the women of color continued to face obstacles at the polls for an even longer period, although they worked in many political campaigns and in coalitions. And in 1938, Crystal Bird Fawcett was the first African-American woman elected to statewide office in Pennsylvania and the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Allison? Yes, I, I can't share my screen until this one is done. So, okay, let's see. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for those wonderful presentations. I'm happy to be here today. I'll be talking about Mary Church Terrell, who was a black suffragist and civil rights activist who marched in the 1913 
uh, women's suffrage parade in DC and picketed uh, the White House with her daughter as part of the National Women's Party during World War I. Based on my new biography, Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell, this paper highlights how once women won ratification of the 19th Amendment in August of 1920, Black uh, women wanted to participate in partisan party politics. Obviously, they had been do doing it for a long time. But in this case, they mobilized their vo votes to defend African Americans' uh, constitutional rights fight against the disenfranchisement of black men as well as women in the South and elect politicians who they hoped would pass a federal anti-lynching bill. By 1920, some black women were Democrats but most still favored the Republican party, the party of Lincoln. For African-American Republican women, voting was a first step toward advancing their civil rights goals. Uh, black women moved quickly to formalize their participation in national partisan party politics. Mary Church Terrell and some of her Washington DC allies set about creating a national black women's party organization that they hoped would be officially sanctioned and financed by the Republican National Committee. Black Republican women also aimed to secure political patronage appointments, similar to those secured by loyal male politicos. Among the most coveted positions were well-paid campaign jobs in the upcoming 1920 presidential election between Republican candidate Warren G. Harding and Democratic candidate James Cox. The Republican National Committee recognized the significance of American women's first national election and made a concerted effort to mobilize the newly enfranchised women of both races for the upcoming presidential election. The RNC committed itself to hiring Black women in key campaign positions. A longtime Republican activist, Mary Church Terrell, lobbied for a paid campaign position. Having secured the backing of the three most powerful Black Republican men in the RNC, Terrell was appointed Director of Work Among Colored Women of the East. Terrell arrived in New York City to begin her work and she sent her husband a delighted description of her new office at RNC headquarters. He replied, I was mighty glad to get your letter this morning and to learn that you had gotten down to work with your secretary. His sense of celebratory triumph was not just for his wife alone. Robert Terrell predicted, woman's suffrage is going to help us mightily. Our women are well-educated and they are inclined to go forward in movements. On the campaign trail, Terrell traveled up and down the East Coast giving speeches, encouraging women to take themselves seriously as partisans whose votes and political influence mattered. In the North and West, where they were generally not disenfranchised, Black women pushed hard to make their votes count, to have political influence. Terrell told, I'm sorry, uh, Terrell told Black women that they had a responsibility to use the 19th Amendment as a weapon of defense in upholding African Americans' constitutional rights. For the suffrage amendment to have real meaning, they had to educate themselves as voters. Colored women should watch carefully what the legislatures of their various respective states are doing and keep posted on the bills which vitally affect us as a race, she said. Seeing the National Association of Colored Women as playing a vital role in voter education, Terrell urged that each state chair on legislation must keep the women of the various states informed on the measures which will help or hinder our race. Colored women should send letters to their state or national representatives, urging them to take a stand for or against measures in which they are especially interested. As she traveled up and down the East Coast giving talks to black voters in 1920, Terrell, a veteran speaker on the national lecture circuit, experienced a shocking run-in with a white railroad ticket agent when she arrived in Dover, Delaware to give a speech. Terrell later described what happened to the NAACP president Moorfield story. I consider myself the first woman victim after the ratification of the 19th amendment north of the Mason-Dixon line. 
I was arrested in Dover, Delaware by the ticket agent five minutes after I reached the city because I asked him if he knew a certain colored man who had been arranging meetings for the Republicans. She cannot find his name in the directory. Uh, he became angered and charged me with disorderly conduct. I was not actually arrested and taken to jail. This is because when railroad agents arrived at her GOP political rally and meeting, they waited until after she finished her speech to present her with the warrant for her arrest and then decided not to hold her in jail because she had been eloquent, did not seem disorderly, and was able to gather the money for a $200 bail fine. In her official repudiation of the charges, she stated that the ticket agent had stormed and raged at me and threatened me with arrest because he saw me standing before him, the representative of a race which he would like to see in slavery today, and he is determined to keep in its place. Terrell did not shrink from the controversy that ensued, explaining, it sometimes happened that a woman has to live up to her highest ideals, even if she knows that by doing so, she may be a victim of unpleasant notoriety for resenting the insult, not only to myself, but through me to the womanhood of the whole race. I would rather be the victim of notoriety than to lose my self-respect because I was too cowardly in a crisis to do what I know to be right. Terrell was untroubled by the possibility of being jailed. Personally, I should not have been worried much if I actually had been arrested. It would have been a good thing. It would have shocked white and black alike if I had been sent to jail on a charge of disorderly conduct. The black men she consulted took a paternalistic approach, worrying about her respectability. The men especially appeared horrified at the thought of my being placed under arrest and assured me that such a disgraceful exper experience would ruin me for life. After the election, Black Republican women planned a conference in Washington, D.C. to build a new national Black women's Republican organization that they hoped would be officially sanctioned by the RNC. They thought that it had been when the three highest ranking Black male Republicans agreed to speak at their meeting, but in the end, the men successfully deflected the women from creating their own organization by endorsing the creation of a female director at the Black Republican headquarters in DC, which forestalled the creation of a permanent Black women's national Republican organization until 1924. But at the time, the women felt celebratory because they had played a significant role in helping to elect Harding and had the prospect of a female director at Black RNC headquarters. Wanting to be the new female director that the men had proposed hiring, Terrell visited RNC offices in New York City. She expected to be rewarded for her strong campaign performance. Terrell also went to the White House to see President Harding's secretary, forming her request for a position in the administration as part of a larger goal. I asked him whether colored people would receive any recognition for their campaign work and votes. Then she visited RNC chair, Postmaster General Will Hayes to ask, are colored women to be recognized, Mr. Hayes? And his response was cagey, not as colored women. Not, there are neither men nor women, black or white in the Republican party. But he assured her, their color will not be held against them. Once in office, Harding greatly disappointed African-Americans hopes for civil rights when he failed to follow through on his initial endorsement of an anti-lynching bill. Terrell continued to work on Republican campaigns throughout the 1920s, but it wasn't until 1929 that she had the opportunity to put her Republican partisanship to great use when she joined the Senate campaign of the new freshman Republican Congresswoman at large from Illinois, uh, Ruth Hannah McCormick, supporting her bid to be the first woman elected to the upper house. McCormick's history of support for women's suffrage and her historic run captured Terrell's imagination, who actually had talked about wanting to run for Senate herself. Thrilled by the prospect of helping to elect a progressive Republican woman who stood for equal justice, Terrell enthused that Illinois voters could blaze a new trail by sending a woman to the Senate. A full 10 years after women secured the franchise, 
suffrage activist Molly Ch Church Terrell had not yet had the opportunity to vote. She was a resident of DC, which was administered by Congress and had no representation on Capitol Hill. That changed in 1930 when Terrell wrote excitedly that she had registered in Illinois using her daughter's Chicago address. I have worked for suffrage all my life and the first vote I shall be able to cast will be for the first woman who has had the courage to run for US Senate. That certainly gives me a kick. Thank you. Thank you, Allison and Wendy and Jill. Um, I'd like to encourage our audience to put questions into the Q&A. And we do have one that we could start with. And I think perhaps Jill might want to answer this one. In terms of campaigns and contributions as women in politics, what is the distinction between Belva Lockwood and Victoria Woodhall? Um, well, Woodhall's the first woman we know to declare for the U.S. presidency. Um, she had an unusual background as a medical spiritualist. Uh, she hooked up with a very wealthy robber baron in New York who helped her get a seat on the stock exchange and publish uh, a newspaper. So she had um, this kind of private money behind her. Uh, along with her own reputation. Uh, Lockwood was a more middle-class woman and um, she pulled together a campaign that was, you know, in part a kind of in your face, um, let me see if I can do it. But then she traveled the country, as I said, she used speaker fees to um, pay for her uh, campaign expenses. Woodhull never got to the final part of her campaign because she came, became involved with um, Anthony Woodstock and uh, issues of um, what had appeared in her newspaper and ended up in jail. So two very different people. Um, and you know, Lockwood wow. is the distinguished lawyer widow. Um, Victoria Woodhull is the flamboyant, beautiful, brainy, uh, free love advocate. And there's a little bit of a follow-up to that. Uh, was Woodhall not too young to qualify and in jail? Um, you know, I can't remember if her birthday occurs right there. Um, but again, these were symbolic campaigns. So, you know, they, they were involved much more in drawing attention simultaneously to the woman because each was ambitious and egotistical, but at the same time, drawing attention to the uh, political subservience of women. So one of the things I learned in the last year was that one of Belva Lockwood's uh, lecture tours to raise money for her campaigns was an appearance at Delaware College. And it was Dr. Ann Boylan who brought that information to our attention in her centennial exhibition, Votes for Delaware Women, and she's speaking tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So that was great to learn. Um, I wondered, uh, Allison, I think you're Research touched certainly on um, the support of organizations and clubs um, and certainly um, these affiliations in Terrell's campaigning and, and networking and her activism. I wonder, Jill and Wendy, if um, you came across organizations, women's organizations, club support and affiliation endorsing candidates, um, how important was that? Wendy, do you want to speak about uh, the uh, San Diego yes. group you just discovered? Yes, so um, there, there were, I mean, some of the, the support came from, uh, some of the women who campaigned, especially early on, were, were activists themselves. They were part of the suffrage organization. Um, but we've also discovered that there were some um, 
uh, in some cases, women who ran had the support of specially organized women's political groups. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, just, just found some in a California newspaper about this. In San Francisco in 1888, um, a, a women's organization was started to get, to get six women, Republican women, onto the San Francisco school board, for example. Um, there, there are reports of this kind of uh, uh, support in many campaigns, um, especially where women actually had political rights. So in Utah, for example, there are Republican women's clubs who helped their candidates get elected. In other cases, some of the offices in some states were nonpartisan. Um, so th there wasn't a political machine behind the, the campaigns. Um, and in some cases, women were well-known educators who wanted to run for an administrative position, which it wasn't political in, in the same sort of way, even though they had to run a campaign and sometimes were challenged. So it, it, it really, it, it changes across states, across time. Um, and what we hope is that um, people using our site will be able to, to do sort of the next stage of this work, um, looking at some of these women specifically, looking at their campaigns, looking at some of the uh, ways in which women were elected. Jill and I have done some of that, um, but obviously we can't do it. We can't do it for thousands, but we're hoping that it'll be, the site will be used as a starting point for many people. Wendy, I'd, I'd love to add to that, that I think one of the things that I've seen is how politicized the temperance movement was. Um, you know, once temperance men and women were enjoined and women were enjoyed to, to use the home ballot, um, you know, we see just an enormous energy being put forth by local and uh, regional and national temperance leaders to get people elected. Um, and it's, it's very powerful. And again, if you go to our website, you'll see that uh, some substantial number of women uh, ran on temperance platforms or on the prohibition um, ticket. Um, and I will just add just one quick thing that you can search by Prohibition Party, for example, so you could find all of those women if you are interested. And again, then you could filter down the information to see who won, you know, where they were. Um, and there is a lot more information that, and da data that Jill and I have collected that is not yet available through the site, but we're hoping that all of those fields will be indexed soon, sooner rather than later. Rebecca, I have a question for Allison. May I throw yep. it over to her? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in where Terrell's papers are and um, what, you, what you were using for uh, your biography. Yeah, they're at the Library of Congress and at Howard University's Morgan Spingarn collection. And then there's a few others that are at um, Oberlin College where she was a graduate. So. Um, that, that's what I would say about that. Um, I saw in the question and answers that there are a couple of questions about um, Terrell. And one of them is about uh, the concept of lifting as we climb, which is a phrase that she used. And somebody wanted to know about when um, she used that and in what context. And that was a phrase, lifting as we climb, that um, was a slogan or the motto for the National Association of uh, Colored Women's Clubs in the uh, 1890s. And um, it's sometimes been seen as a way to say that uh, Terrell was more elitist and thinking that she needed to you know, lift up uh, poor black women as, as they climbed in a kind of maternalist way. But I actually think it was more uh, meant to be more in solidarity, given that she and her parents were all born into slavery, although she was um, emancipated by the time she was two. Um, but in any event, um, the other question that I saw was about um, Black men and their role in supporting Black women's uh, political activism and the right to vote, especially. And um, compared to white 
men, I, my sense is that they were more in favor. But on the other hand, um, what we do see is that black women were almost universally in support of the vote for women. And white women, that's not true, right? For white women, the suffragists were the minority. Um, but for black women, they could see that women needed the right to vote as much as they did see that black men had been given the right to vote and then were almost immediately disenfranchised. So they were really concerned about that. And they saw themselves as linked, their fate linked to black men's fate and needing to work on civil rights as a whole for both groups. Um, but black men um, did need to be persuade to, persuaded to some degree. And so uh, W.B. Du Bois had a couple of issues in 1911 and 1915 of the crisis, the NAACP magazine, that were devoted to trying to convince mainly black men uh, that voting rights for women was a good thing. And so they had a series of black men and women participating in that discussion in those symposia in order to try to kind of move the dialogue further. Allison, was it the case that there was um, tension within uh, local black women's decision whether to put their energies into running um, black women for candidacies versus putting their energies into promoting their um, black colleagues first. I, I had read that that was the case with some groups in Chicago, for example. Yeah, I mean, most of the women who I've read about didn't seem to think that uh, that they would be successful if they ran themselves. I know that Mary Church Terrell really wanted to be in the Senate and instead she worked on the Senate campaign of a white woman because that seemed to her uh, to be a more plausible possibility than running herself. Um, they did support black men who were politicians and worked for their political campaigns. I'm sure, it, as you pointed out, that there were m many or some cases where black women were running for these offices um, themselves, but it definitely wasn't the primary approach. And I, I'm not sure entirely why that's the case. I know that they were fully politicized and Mary Church Terrell was involved in lots of GOP campaigning long before the 1920 campaign where she's um, named as the director of colored women's work of the East, right? So, so she was doing, they were doing the campaigning work but they weren't running as much themselves. And I, I'm not a hundred percent sure about why. Interesting. Do you have a sense of why? No, I don't. I don't, but I think, you know, a great question for people to be pursuing yeah. in the future. So I'd like to pick up a little bit more on what Jill asked about, um, because in her own right is all about making sources available to support research. And you as historians, each of you have been involved in finding resources. And Allison, you might be able to say a little bit more about your role in new Mary Church Terrell sources, his uh, archival sources, as well as artifacts. But also, Jill and Wendy, I wondered if your um, large project uh, located any new sources or, um, you know, if you located descendants um, who might have archival sources that weren't known before and maybe didn't think about who, you know, their ancestors were that were involved in politics. Allison, you wanna pick that up first and then maybe Wendy can jump in? Sure. Um, yeah, one of the fun things about being able to meet, um, well, not just fun, re truly rewarding uh, things about being able to meet the Terrell's family members was um, the yeah. chance to help work with them to get some of her material objects to the National uh, Mall to be in the new National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture. And then also the final papers that they still held at their home in Annapolis, uh, Maryland area, um, get, getting them donated to Oberlin College. 
And um, that's been very rewarding because now they're publicly available. And um, because the museum is closed and the Smithsonian is still closed, uh, some of Terrell's uh, material objects are available on the website in a digital form. So, Wendy? Um, we, we haven't, as far as I can remember, we've not located any descendants of any of these women. But of course, we're not doing the kind of biographical project that Allison has done where we're pursuing all the resources that we can possibly find. I, I would say in terms of resources that were kind of a, a, a watershed for our project were a couple of things. One was going back to the history of women's suffrage with a different lens, not just looking at the suffrage, but looking for names of women who are elected. And there are actually hundreds and hundreds of women listed in the history of women's suffrage. In some chapters, they would list all of the county superintendents of schools um, in an in a early race. Um, the other thing is, I have to say at eBay and finding actual ballots um, from various states which list women. And I think we've probably got about, Jill and I have been collecting material for a few years now. And um, I think we probably have about 20 ballots, including one that you saw the earliest one from 1877 from Boston. But just some of those early ones, the, the ones that we collected early on, just seeing there was like, wow, there's an actual ballot here um, with a woman's name on it. And of course, from Boston, not the one you saw, but a different one, um, which was a woman's only ballot because women in Massachusetts could only vote for school committees. So they had to have special, uh, a special ballot printed up just for women. Um, and a colleague of ours, Ken Flory, whom you may know, has a really wonderful collection of suffrage materials, actually has a woman's... Um, uh, a ballot box. Um, I don't know from which state, but you know, these things come up. He also recently collected a women's vacuum cleaner that was handed out to, to delegates at a uh, national, so national women, so women suffrage association meeting. We, we, he and I wondered how they got them home, but that's beside the point. So there's, there's all this wonderful material out there, but, and I think for us also um, state reports all of this information has been available for decades, but nobody has been able to collect it in the way we, we have been able to do because of the internet and web and, and a database. So Wendy and Allison and Jill, we are at time. So I hate to call this short. We thank you for your great work and finding these archives and objects and places really enliven the history and bring much more to light for us to understand. And this is so important. Um, thank you all for participating. Thank you for the audience. And thank you so much to the PAC School team for In Her Own Right. Indeed. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye-bye. Yeah.